And hello, this is Julio Martinez, your host for Creative Current on LA Art Stream. Today we're going to be focusing on something I've watched all my life and know absolutely nothing about <laughs> animation. But I have two raging experts here with me. Hi, guys, can you introduce Hi. yourselves? Sure, my name is Richard Baisley. I'm the uh, director of Lost Treasure Hunt. I'm Matt Davis, executive producer, and I came up with the story for Lost Treasure Hunt. This is a very interesting uh, concept in animation. It seems like I've seen it all my life, but yet it looks very new. Um, my limited knowledge is that animation generally comes from um, someone drawing the images to something being completely computer generated. Right, well actually this, this is a hybrid ah. of the two. Um, I, I come from a traditional 2D background. I was a lead animator at Disney on uh, Hercules and Pocahontas and uh, later at Warner Brothers um, on the you, do, you made a lot of drawings. So a lot of drawings. <laughs> I mean, so much so, you, yeah, you, your hand is hurt. <laughs> hundreds of drawings. And, um, but technology has, has come in, computer animation came in, and uh, Toy Story, and it changed the whole landscape. And I've adapted that. I've moved more into directing now anyway, um, both animation and live action. But in this show, what we've done is... Uh, the, uh, the, the images are 2D and graphic, uh, and we create them on a digital uh, Cintiq with a, with a pen. Um, and then we make uh, what we call symbols in this program, and we can manipulate those symbols. So the animators take them and manipulate the symbols in the program called Flash. Now, the computer, now it, it's great. It has loads of tools. There's lots of things you can do. But it's still a lot of the best guys really come from that traditional background because um, they know how to perform and act and tell a story. So, like anything the computer, it's a tool. It depends who's using it. We find treasures to share with the world. Not this time. You've lost the treasure hunt, and in a moment, you will lose the treasure. Do you still have your new invention? You mean endless fog? Of course, but... Uh... How long do we have? Three minutes. Endless fog? And it only lasts three minutes? It's not perfected. How did uh, the whole process <laughs> move forward from idea to actually coming up with a pilot? Like many different animation projects, uh, sometimes it takes many years from the type, time that the idea is hatched until the time that mm -hmm. the uh, show can be produced. Uh, and the project itself started when a group of us from Feature Animation got together because we noticed that in educational television, many of the shows had a very similar feel. They tended to be geared towards preschool, and we thought, well, what would it be like if we could make uh, an educational show that was exciting and fast-paced? Whoa! You can warn me next time! Just keep driving and scoot up! You're hogging the seat! And what started off as an experimental project of how do we combine history and an adventure uh, has resulted in this pilot, which is um, an action thriller with plot twists and uh, character arcs. You saw other treasure hunters here? Even better. I saw what they dug up. Three square stones, large letters on top, and on the side, mysterious carvings. <sighs> Ava will never believe this. Dex is never gonna believe this. What is your name? Azaka, but some call me Falcon. Well, Falcon, I need you to tell me everything you know. Ava! <laughs> Dex, wait till you hear this. No, wait till you see this. Stolen by Ivan, but photographed by one of our agents. A sleuth agent here? Codename Falcon. Did you say Falcon? Is everything okay? Oh yeah, everything is just fine. It's time to finish this treasure hunt. Where to next? And uh, we we're fortunate to have come away with two Emmy nominations, which was very unexpected as well. Well, one of the things I found interesting and kind of exciting in watching the pilot is I spent many years working for PBS, and I was so used to the fact that a show would go to a certain point, come to a stop, and everything you needed to know historically about it was told as a kind of static pitch. It looks like you guys have incorporated the history reveal in the process of the show. Mm -hmm. What we've noticed is uh, many times when you try to put educational content into a show, it ends up stopping the story Columbus dead. Columbus traveled west from Palos, keeping detailed notes in his logbook that give us information about the course he sailed across the Atlantic Ocean. Just tell me where he went. What do you think this is, public television? So from the start, the objective of Lost Treasure Hunt was always to find out 
how do we get the historical information and literally bake it into the plot? Yeah. Uh -huh. How do we make it so that the, uh, the history information actually drives the plot forward and you can't separate it from the blah, story? Blah, blah, blah. We're not here for a history lesson. Get her! Wh where? Anywhere! Just get her! Did you know Columbus actually made four voyages? He thought he reached East Asia and never really knew he landed in a new continent. Yeah. That's the, that's the key, integrating it. Um, because the first time that we had the script, I storyboarded the, the first time, most of it the first time. And when we looked at it, um, it, it was too heavily expositional. Um, it was very heavy, in too many facts, too laborsome. So we were able to go back, because it was edited together in, in the storyboard program. I could put it together, see how it's looking, and you can just tell how uh, it's feeling and looking. So we could go back, rewrite bits, and make it, bake it together, exactly like Matt says, um, and, and make it you know, an entertaining show to watch. Now, I'm sure you guys are not doing this all by yourselves in a no. garage somewhere. No. So you, uh, <laughs> Do you have a production team? So we came up with a basic plot and what, where we wanted it to go. How is the history going to serve the story? And our writer, David Rosenberg, who we were very lucky to have, a very talented writer who comes from Nickelodeon and other places, would flesh it out. Uh, now, for many of us coming from features, that's the start of our process. The idea now is, uh, just like in feature animation, it's not just about the words on the page. It's about how do we now bring it to life visually? And this extensive storyboard process, which Richard did practically single-handedly. And by the way, that's because what do you have to do in this process? You have to find a way to uh, uh, have a stunning visual style and also balance the characters and find a way to make it cinematically interesting. And it's very difficult to do, so we relied so heavily on, on Richard to, to realize it. So basically, it. We, we, we were a small crew, but we, we, I mean, we had uh, Ghost Spot in San Francisco. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Oh. Let's go Spot. Ghost Spot. OK, Ghost Spot. Well, one of the best little animation studios in the country. Um, so they're based off in San Francisco. Um, my co-director was Rocky Ballesteros. Um, <laughs> Sounds the, like a character. Yes, does it? Uh, he is a character. Um, okay. Then there's uh, the animation director, um, Alan Lau, and Brad Rao. So they're the three partners of GoSpot, and they've got the whole team. They've got a whole team of animators um, up there. So um, so there's myself, Matt, the writer, uh, the team at Ghost And the team is amazing. Um, we, fantastic. But we came in with a storyboarding process that we did and we had in our heads like how did we want it to look? We wanted it to have a, a graphic style and we were going to use a program called Flash but we didn't want it to look like some of the other Flash shows that, that right. tend to be uh, the action is a little stilted yes. and we wanted it to be more like a, a, a hybrid of classic animation mm -hmm. and when we went to Ghostbot they said, oh, it, we're working on stuff just like that. And they now, showed us. Excuse me, is Flash a software program? Software. Okay. That's it. And, and that's, that's, that's all it is. So it's how you use it, how you use it. And there's a lot of places that you use it, but the more stilted shows we're talking about, there's a lot of uh, TV shows are done on a much smaller budget. I mean, features, 150 million, you know, we don't have that amount. So you have to cut some corners, but you can do it in a way that's still creative. And very, I mean, you look at some of the old Disney films, um, Sword in the Stone with some of the gorgeous backgrounds by Walt Paraguay. Uh, gorgeous backgrounds, but you'll cut close to a character and it'll just be a plain color behind. So in CGI, you'd have the model, you'd have it textured, you'd have it rigged, you'd have it lit, all by these, and, and it's just it's such a huge process, but in 2D, you can be simpler. You've got the, somebody draws a character and somebody does the background. It's a bit, bit easier. So, um, so it looks uh, like you have the concept, uh, you have the creative aspect, you have a production company, a capable yes, production very, company. Very, very it looks like you can create all the lovely images you yes, want, yes. but you need compelling characters compelling to uh, right. cross the attention. Um, I noticed you had two young people. Us? On a real mission? Neither of us yep. are Columbus. It, um, it looks like one is a nerd who yep. falls over his own feet. Yep, the know. other is a very physically adept young lady oh, who sort of jumps all around him. A bit of a show off, but I have to admit, the girl's got moves. We have Dex and Ava. Um, Ava's multilingual and very dynamic and physical. We say and he's very much in the museum doing his, his work. Dex! Oh, it's about time they gave us the same mission. Ava, back from Japan already. Let me guess. Three, no, four new Japanese dialects. And I'm going to say 
two new black belts? <laughs> the training mission was amazing. Next time, Dex, you are coming along. Oh no, way too much going on for me here at the museum. Experiments in the lab. And in the process of making the film, you, you, we want to develop real characters. So when you've got the script and you give it, you get it to the storyboard artist, in this case myself, and we, we had uh, some other board guys too, um, you take it a, a bit further. So you develop the character in the storyboard. So if there was a scene, say, where they're being chased by the bad guys and Dex runs down some steps, I'd have her jump on the railings and slide down. Then there's another scene right after that, actually, where jump. they jump onto a boat. She jumps and lands beautifully on the, on the deck. He lands straight to a pile of fish. That's not in the script. So as a storyboard artist, you add those things. Now, um, they wouldn't be running and jumping and being chased unless there were some bad guys mm. involved in this. Yes. Is that the series of the show? Are they constantly dealing in a problem to be solved mm. and uh, something to move the story yes. forward that also incorporates the history inherent yes. in yes. the episode. Well, so many television shows have sort of a um, hyper-serialized storytelling where you get caught up in the characters and you, uh, you want to see what happens episode to episode. It doesn't happen as much in animation. So one of the things we wanted to do with Lost Treasure Rent was find a way to bring that type of storytelling, which is often very common in live action television, mm -hmm. and bring like a, an edge of your seat kind of a feel to it, uh, where you get caught up in the characters and... Are you uh, talking about an old fashioned cliffhanger? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, and, and by the way, a lot of it has to do with how we put the history into it. We didn't just want to do a show that you know, had a little bit of history. We wanted to find a way that the history would drive the plot forward. So what would we do? We, instead of slowing down so that we could get historical information in, we actually would speed up. Yeah. They would solve clues. Yeah. Uh, information about what they need to solve is being delivered while they're being chased by the bad like guys. They're, they're learning things. They're yeah. learning things That's about history. That's what Columbus history. named the people when he thought they landed in the Indies. But they were actually called Tainos. And solving problems. Yeah. So it seems like a natural kind of division at the road. One problem is solved, but oh, low. Dex, it is the next They've clue. They've discovered something else that's yes. going to take them down another road. That's, that's you it. probably noticed at the end of the pilot, there is a, a surprise ending that sets up the rest of the series, where it looks to us, watching the pilot, like it's a very straightforward adventure, a clue hunt. But when they get to the end of the pilot episode, they discover things that don't quite make sense. You will make sure the sleuth agents never find out the real treasure hunt has begun. These are things that are revealed in future episodes that we haven't had a chance to, to fund or to make yet. Yeah. Uh, but it, it carries through the characters and it carries through the, this, this world and, and, and gets us to explore it in a way, using, the, using history as a way to, yeah. to get into it. Well, you now have established a track record. You've been on PBS. Mm -hmm. You have gotten some nice award nominations yes. and some awards. Yes. Uh, so the thing is, where does that take you next? The, um, for us, it's always about story and getting caught up in the characters. Uh, there's lots of places we want to take these characters, and that's what we think is going to happen next. If uh, um, this treasure hunt mixed with adventure and characters is really something that can take us anywhere. If we uh, can do more uh, episodes, the next one would be about the Revolutionary War. Uh, we have another episode about Harriet Tubman clues along the Underground Railroad. We can really go anywhere in the world. We have, from ancient Greece mm -hmm. to modern Russia and China, uh, even subjects in the arts and sciences. Uh, and so what our hope would be is that this mixture of, of, of education and adventure would reach out to a, a, a wider audience and find a way to not just interest them in history, but also interest them in what's a really cool idea for a series. and get caught up in the characters and the, the action. I, I think what we've done with the pilot is whet people's appetites, so they want to see more. And, well, uh, obviously yeah. you um, got the encouragement of the National Endowment for yeah. the Humanities, yeah. got funding for them, and the one thing I know about an endowment from the federal government, it's not enough money. So yes. uh, <laughs> you probably got some additional funding um, to finish the episode. We so did. what's the plan? the fiscal plan for the future. Yes, uh, additional funding. It, one of the reasons why it took as long as it did to make the pilot, uh, many of us who are used to working in features would, uh, would do what we can to try to improve the story, have a collaborative process, 
and we would also continually run out of money and find <laughs> private donations uh, for people who are interested in history. Uh, and we still ran out of money and even had to do a Kickstarter yeah, to help but, us get just a little the, bit. The Kickstarter started work. We, we put it together, we need that extra bit, and um, we got the goal yes. way before the deadline. Um, so people are hungry to see this. People, well, I keep saying the Emmy nominations back up. The fact <laughs> this is a cool show, we have to make more. Um, well, it's a great calling card to have. It's a great calling card. Yeah. And, and, you know. and we've been fortunate that uh, public television has allowed us to explore this idea. It, it gave us a creative freedom that we really thought we needed to have. We're doing a mixture of history with a fast-paced storytelling and throw, in to, throw into the mix all these character arcs. We didn't think it would be possible unless we could experiment. And we didn't think the series would survive if it had to conform to like a network idea of what it should be. Mm -hmm. So it was really important to us that we had a place where we could try out the ideas and experiment, and it had found an audience on public television. I mean, Usually it usually does. Yeah. I mean, a lot of original ideas are always very, very hard to, because a lot of studios will go with franchises and what already exists and exploit that. So we're at the beginning of a journey here. We're creating something new. It's a bit like, say, Breaking Bad. Nobody wanted to know about it. But you create something that's uh, of interest and original, and it will eventually find its way. Um, you know, you both probably have noticed that in the last year or two, there's been a great expanse in outlets for uh, video and digital, yes. um, expanding yes. from the, you know, the norm of yeah. network television yeah. to cable television, yeah. um, now to uh, entities like Amazon Studios yeah. and Netflix yeah. that give an added opportunity. Is this something that you think would play on that? And you so. aiming that so, way yeah. as well. I think it depends on how the show, which is really young in its distribution course here, how, how it ends up getting discovered. And we're, we're thankful for things like the Emmy nominations that have brought some, uh, that have brought some attention to the show. And I think uh, of the many different types of ways we can take this program, we believe that there's an audience out there that can that is really inter interested in this kind of product. And, and it feels very unique. It feels very different with what we're well, trying to do. Well, right now, as we speak, it's playing at the Shanghai TV Awards, which my brother lives over there, and it's <laughs> huge. So, ah, so we're, we're on tender hooks to find out how it does. You just tonight. launched me into a whole different <laughs> subject. Um, I took note of the fact that you don't have a Brooklyn accent. <laughs> you're, you're not from East LA. I'm not from here. No. no. Uh, so, do you have that those kind of connections to actually go across the pond? Ah, yes. I mean, as we speak, we're looking into the BBC right now. So ah. we're, we're looking into the avenue, and, and uh, we'll, we'll let you know if anything happens. <laughs> <laughs> well, it seems to me you have one really big thing going for you. Um, everyone that sometime or another studied history. Right. May be forced to do it, but they yeah. still have it. Yeah. They have yes. an awareness of it. Yes. It's not a foreign subject. Yeah. Um, it's not like trying to uh, get someone interested yeah. in nuclear fission. Yeah. So, therefore, you, it seems like you could cross many generations the, I, from I wanna, childhood to adult. I want to jump in here about this because it's something I feel very strongly about because um, when I was a, a youngster, I loved history and really enjoyed it. And I, I did it with what we called um, O level. Uh, age, which is around 14, you, you study O levels. Then at 16, you move on to what's called A levels, a higher level. Sounds and, boring. And it, <laughs> it sounds boring. But um, history was one of them, and I chose history. And I used to go to the classes, and the tutor who was from Oxford, he was a very, very bright man. We would all come in with these books, this big clunk. They'd sit down the books, and he'd say, OK, dictation. We'd open the book, and it would be solid dictation for a whole hour every day, you know, to solid. So there was no learning process. It was just purely, and I dropped it. I got bored. And it put me off history for a while. Then later on, I would start to watch, we mentioned the BBC, some of the wonderful BBC programs, educational hist history uh, programs. And I loved them. Why? Because they had stories with an engaging presenter or actor, or, and they became real. When it's abstract, it goes over my head. But it, so that's why I enjoyed when Matt approached me for this project and said it's a hist history show. Um, I'd love to do this because it has all the ingredients that appeal to me. And you're not um, going to run out of story ideas. No, never, never. Let us end the story. So. 
Yeah. I mean, no, no half hour is ever going to be able to explore any history subject thoroughly. So what are we really trying to do with, with the series is we're trying to get people interested in history. We're not really trying to fill a bucket with facts. We're trying to ignite a fire. <laughs> and what, what Lost Treasure Hunt does really well and what we discovered as we would show audiences test versions of the show is this fast moving, don't stop for the educational content uh, way of telling a story, in many ways, is, is, as ironic as it sounds, helps people to understand it better. Um, instead of having to uh, remember facts, we are getting people caught up in a story. Yeah. And they're understanding better how did the events of that time uh, relate to the people and what did it mean to them and what does that mean to us today? Um, it always seems strange to us that people would say history is boring. It seems like it's so full of it? wonderful, great stories. The original logbook of Columbus. This is the story of 1492 in Columbus's own words. Columbus's logbook is a story of, of his travels. And on, in our lost treasure hunt, mm -hmm. we follow his journey uh, as we go through the clues in his logbook from Italy to Spain to Haiti and all the way back to the Azores. Um, things that I didn't know, uh, because I'm English, we didn't study it so much. <laughs> Um, the fact that he traveled um, west to get to the east because he thought it'd be quicker because he knew they knew the world was round and they didn't know there was some continents. You know, <laughs> called, what's it called, America? <laughs> well, it's proven that history as a narrative always can be exciting, yeah. especially if you throw in something where you well, they feel they're discovering something new. Mm -hmm. Even a, a true fiction like the Da Vinci Code yes. had that aspect yeah, yeah, of yeah. there seemed to be some yeah. historical probability yeah. Yeah. that it could be true. And, and, and as you say, it, we've got all this historical stuff with action-packed, James Bond action. It has everything. Yeah. Yeah. And it seems inherent to the plot. There always has to be a problem to solve, a so, mystery yes. to uh, get through, yeah. and a villain to defeat. Yes, and it's, it's what I call, when I read the script, a, a page turner. You want to know what's happening next. So if you've got a good script, you don't want to stop. And that's what this has. Mm -hmm. yeah, the, the opening scene is a good example of what we were trying yeah. to do, both in story and in animation. Uh, what you see is we start in the middle of a chase, which Columbus is very different from anything you'd see in educational yeah. television. It's different from most children's Ready television shows. It's more like a feature where you have to catch up to the story as it's moving along and our secret agent is being chased by a villain. But what you learn in the course of the pilot, spoiler alert here, by the way, mm -hmm. is uh, the opening scene was our secret agent turning the tables on the villain and setting him up. Uh, so those type of twists are what we're trying to explore and do things that are different from other series. Well, it doesn't talk down to an audience. So the younger audience now is so much more sophisticated uh, than it, in fact. <laughs> Uh, my kids are brighter than me. <laughs> a lot of these things they pick up. It's obvious. You know. Our audiences but, were always more sophisticated. Yeah. You, know, uh, you also did a really nice thematic beginning because it seems like you're in the middle of an action. Yes. Because when it starts out, we know that our heroes know the villains. Mm. The villains know the heroes. They've had a history together, yeah. mm -hmm. a yeah. shared history. Yeah. And this is just a continuation of that cat and mouse yes. a cat That's chase. That's exactly what it is. Yeah, yeah. The, the opening is also a good example of uh, we didn't just want to do a digital flash show, but we wanted to find a way to introduce traditional animation. And the opening scene has a lot of that combination of flash and traditional. Yeah, I, I mean, the whole chase um, across. I, I did the storyboard, but um, when we went to the studio uh, at, at Ghost Spot, um, although I was stepping back and directing, they were aware of my, when I used to animate, my, my work from The Iron Giant, and they said, could you rough out some stuff? Just do some rough animation. Although they're manipulating shapes for the action sequences, I went in and just did traditional rough, almost stick figure action. And they were able to match to that. That's um, great. And, and, um, and it was great because they, they were fans of the Iron Giant and they knew more work from that. And, and it was just a great uh, uh, interaction for of artists. You know. Now, where you are right now, are you doing uh, more airings or sc screenings of this pilot? Um, we are getting prepared for a re-release coming this October on public television. Great. Uh, while that's happening, we've uh, also seen some interest from different festivals and different mm. um, distribution outlets. 
and we're exploring everything now mm -hmm. from DVDs to st uh, online streaming. Yeah. And we're looking forward to seeing it on, on, uh, on PBS stations through our distributor, American Public Television, this October when the next Columbus Day happens. Because in the last screenings, on, on the, how many stations did it play across the states? About uh, half of all uh, stations nationwide were able to pick up wow. on Lost Treasure. That, that was pretty bold, yeah. So Is yes. that going to be through PBS then? Uh, uh, through an in, through yeah. a, a independent distributor, American Public Television, right. but on local PBS stations, correct? Mm -hmm. Right, and local PBS stations have the op option to pick up the feed or not pick up the feed. Exactly, mm -hmm. and we may get even more stations this time with a little bit of track record and some interest yeah. in the, in the program. It doesn't hurt to have it, say, in and around uh, Columbus Day or you know, just added interest yes. to it. It's what they call a good uh, scheduling hook to try to find a way to uh, to show it on television and that tie into Columbus Day, where there happens to be very little age-appropriate content about Columbus mm. makes it makes it easier as well. So, um, who are the salespeople going out and hawking this? <laughs> ah, good question. Yeah, <laughs> there's. Uh, it's mostly through our distributor, American Public Television. And there are different people, some of whom were funded by the Kickstarter uh, yeah. campaign we did, yeah. who are helping us. And, and a lot of it is word of mouth. Uh, people are really catching on to the spirit of what we're trying to do, especially with Columbus. Uh, the, Columbus is a subject where there's many different opinions. And our <laughs> objective with doing Columbus is to not have a particular agenda, but to provide multiple mm. viewpoints on yeah. the subject and find a way to get audiences interested to go find out on their own. Mm. Your, uh, your voices are attractive. I, I, I get the feeling you got some real pros involved in this. We, we did. We've got one really big pro. Was Yuri. Oh, we have a lot of talented people working on this project. We have uh, the voice cast led by Yuri Lowenthal. Mm. We have uh, uh, the music, which was done by uh -huh. Chance Thomas. Uh, who actually, whilst you mentioned Chance. Yeah. I mean, we were talking about the uh, his uh, theme for it earlier and how uh, catchy and, and how dramatic it was. I mean, we're, we're, uh, if you take um, uh, films like Star Wars or, or any of those great films, if you take, or Jaws, if you take the music away, it's such a, a huge... No, music, you need the music. Music is such a huge thing and people always forget. So, I mean, we've got a great show, but didn't his score bring it to another level? Yeah, he comes time. from a video game background and has created quite a career out of that. Yeah and does amazing orchestral scores. Wonderful. And he actually approaches it, his movies like uh, almost like a method actor. He, yeah. he has to get into the, the, the project. And he, and he did some early versions of the music. And, it, and at a certain point, he found the right kind of vibe. Mm. He, he was able to mm. use, uh, in addition to the orchestral sound, he was able to find a way to put in uh, pan flutes and old tribal sounding mm. Mm. that really kicked the score up to a new place. We get emails all the time from people saying, I love the score, That's it's awesome. fantastic. And it, he really did a fantastic job. Well, the one nice thing about a score that becomes memorable, mm -hmm. it becomes indelibly linked Thanks. to the show. And someone could be hearing a segment yes. on the radio, their mind will still awesome. go back to the mm -hmm. images yes. of the show that yes. it represented. Yeah. Oh. And uh, Chance Thomas, the composer, uh, also clued into something that we've tried to run throughout the entire series, which is the idea that we're combining s things that are really ancient with the modern. Yeah. Throughout the uh, pilot episode, you'll notice the, the characters are solving clues about uh, things that are hundreds of years old, but they're doing it on holographic devices. <laughs> and and it, it's informed every part of our production design to try to find a way to combine it. And even the music, that sort of, that feel that's a little bit ancient, but it's also modern in well, a the sense. The old and new, some of the early design work of the, uh, the, the under the museum. We had oh, the headquarters, we, we had the headquarters. yeah. We had some designs with screens. And it looked, it didn't look right, it looked retro. And then we started looking at all the new films, Mission Impossible, the new Alien film, mm -hmm. and all this holographic work. And times have moved, and so we had to catch up, and we adapted all our designs to be current. Yeah. Because um, otherwise, otherwise it, that stuff, it dates so fast. I am Enigma, the cipher code database. While we have a lot of modern things in the, in the program, we're trying to tap into what are some of the great themes of history? What are some of the great character things that are going to make people interested in, in what happens to these characters next? And, and we think that this, this combination of, 
of history and adventure is going to find a way to reach out to people who may not ordinarily watch yeah. uh, a, a, an educational show or may not even ordinarily watch an adventure show. Mm. But by doing this combination of different elements, the way, we, cool. the way we're doing, we're trying to reach out to uh, different audience groups and, and create, create a show that parents would want to watch with their children. Mm. Now, is your writer doing the research, or do you have independent research and then present it to your writer? During that early process where we come up with the plot and work with our writer, there actually are some history experts as well. Uh -huh. And they're there to keep us on track uh, to make sure we, uh, we don't go too far in any one particular direction. But, but more than that, their observations on the history actually help us kick the story up to, and take it to, to new and better places. So rather than just trying to supply information that's accurate, they're also bringing us to a new place, finding a way to make this combination yeah, work. even sharper. Yeah. You sound very good. I really applaud the effort. I was just wildly curious. It's like this is another sort of mystery adventure, how yes. you, your project's going to move forward. Gosh. Well, what we want to do is, is put it out there, create a good show, and I believe it will have the legs. People will find this. Um, I keep going back to the, the Iron Giant film that I worked on years ago. When it came out, it didn't do anything. But on DVD, word of mouth, it continued. So I would, I would agree believe if you create a great show uh, with great content, this will find the legs to move forward. I'm very confident in that. Well, I hope you can utilize this program <laughs> to help <laughs> the sure effort along. Uh, yeah. 30 minutes goes by very fast, yes. especially when you have intriguing video to accompany <laughs> it. But um, for our audience out there, this is your host, Julio Martinez. And you have been listening to Creative Current on LA Art Street. Mm -hmm.